Thank you so much for the music. I appreciated those numbers. Uh, I need to make an announcement tonight that has to do with Daryl McNeil. I think most of you know he's in the hospital. He's listed here among those that need to be prayed for, but he's just hovering between life and death tonight. The family has been called, and so we need to especially pray for him and for the rest of those that are in this time of difficulty. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this time of worship, for this time when we could sing and worship our lovely Lord Jesus Christ, who is altogether lovely and deserving of all of our praise and all of our adoration. And Lord, I pray for this gentleman, Daryl McNeil, you know about him, and you know the situation in which he finds himself tonight. And I pray that you would minister to him and to his family. You know all about them. And so we leave them in your loving care tonight and pray that your will would be done. I don't know the situation at all, but you do. And we're so grateful, our God, that we can leave him and the family in your hands and pray for your special touch upon them in a very special and wonderful way. Draw them close to yourself during this time. Lord, I would ask also again tonight that you would minister to our hearts during this service. You know my need tonight, and you know the need of every individual in this congregation. You know how to speak to us. You know how to minister to our hearts. And Lord, I'm bringing a message tonight that's not easy to preach, but it's a message that is needed, I think, in these days in which we live. It seems like, Lord, so many times we, we get our attention on so many other things other than upon you, and as a result, we get cold of heart, and, and our lives can be those that we know you, and we do love you, and yet we sort of do our own thing. Forgive us when that has been the case, and help each one of us tonight to catch a, a new glimpse of ourselves before you and to understand that they're not standing before Bob Dunlop or Terry Woodcock or a deacon's board. They're standing before you, and we must give an account of ourselves to you because that's the most important thing that we will ever do in our lives and in eternity, to give an account of what we are and what we have done for you. So speak to us in a very special way tonight, and Lord, in as far as it is possible, would you hide this servant and exalt Jesus Christ to our hearts and our lives, that he might be seen above everything else. For I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Now this is Mother's Day, and I know that uh, you've had a message on mothers this morning, and I'm not bringing a Mother's Day message tonight. But I got to honor my own mother. She was a special lady to me. Uh, my father died when I was only 12 years of age, and uh, she was left with eight of us under 16 to bring up alone, and a very difficult time to bring that large a family up, although there were some that were a bit older, but it was a difficult time for her. And this morning I sat down when I was having my quiet time and I wrote a number of things down in my journal about her. One of them was this, that she really was the one who led me to Christ. Uh, she saw my predicament and she knew that I was a teenager who was going away from the Lord. And I was 16 years old and not living the way I should live at all. And uh, there had been blessing in our area, and, and a number had been saved, and there was a baptism service. And some of this I've told you before, but I'm reminded of her again that she invited me to that service that day, and uh, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And it was just a wonderful change that took place in my life. I was baptized that, with the others that were baptized that day. And then a year later, God gave me a wonderful love for the Scriptures, and I began to read the Bible. And... I read it and read it and marked it and read it and marked it and read it and marked it, and a lot of it I didn't understand, but I had a real hunger for it. And I can remember going up into my bedroom on Saturday afternoons and just spending the afternoon reading the Bible and talking to the Lord. I wouldn't have talked to the Lord out loud before a congregation. That would have been, that would have been terrible probably, but I could talk to the Lord, and he understood my fumbling around and so on and so forth, and it was just a wonderful time 
to talk with him. But one day, a year after I'd accepted Christ, I sensed God's call in my life to ministry. And I fell down over my bed and just wept for a long time. I don't know how long I was there, but I was a long time there because I didn't think I would ever be able to do what I was asked to do. And after I got my emotions controlled, I went downstairs and I said to my mother, God spoke to me this afternoon and he's called me to ministry. And she said, you want me to call the pastor? And he came down and came up into the bedroom and we sat and talked for quite a while. He urged me to go to Bible school and, and uh, a lot of things uh, happened over that next little while. And in just a few weeks, I was in Bible school studying the Word of God the best three years of my entire life were spent there. I had to learn some discipline. I had to learn a lot of things. But boy, I tell you, it was just a wonderful time of learning the Word of God. And I knew that God had called me to ministry. I knew that. I had no doubt about that. But when I was thinking about my mother this morning, I thought about so many things that she impacted upon my life. And one of them was that she prayed. She was a praying woman, and I many, many times I would come in at night as a teenager, and I always knocked on her door and let her know I was there. She probably knew anyway, but I knocked on her door and opened the door and uh, looked in. Many a night I'd look in, and she'd be on her knees by her bed, and she always prayed on her knees. She got on her knees by her bed. In fact, when she was 93 years of age, the night before she died, Dina looked into the bedroom and she's on her knees praying. And that's the way she prayed. That's just the way she was. And she prayed not loud, but she prayed out loud. She didn't whisper it. She just talked to the Lord. And that's a wonderful blessing to think back to those days when, when she just uh, impacted my life. I, I can only say that. She just impacted my life. One of uh, the family... Uh, the young man, two years older than me, his name was Haldine, and he became very rebellious, and she couldn't handle him. She had a hard time with him. Uh, he became later on an alcoholic, and, uh, but later on came to Christ, under, our, under my ministry, by the way, led him to Christ. And, but he got saved, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. But she had a, tr she had a hard time with him. He, uh, he got very rebellious. She couldn't handle him at all. He went to stay with a relative for some time, and, and uh, they had a hard time with him too, I think. And then he stayed with my brother and his wife for a number of years because he worked with my brother, worked for my brother. And so uh, he got straightened out after a while, and, and I'm so grateful that he came to know the Lord as his Savior. But I'm not going to spend any more time about my mom, but... I had to just say something to you about her tonight because she was very special. She, uh, she just weighed about 110 pounds when my dad died. She'd had 13 kids. No wonder she weighed just 110 pounds. I mean, 13 children. That's a lot of children, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm in the middle of all of that. And uh, anyway, thank the Lord for my mom. Turn your Bibles tonight to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, I want to begin to read at verse 1 and read through the end of verse 7. And then I'm going to s sort of stray from that a little bit. I'll come back to it, okay, in the latter part of my message. But Ephesians chapter 2, what a tremendous passage of Scripture it is. It's about the Ephesian church. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden cant lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have pers persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, that's a quite a nevertheless. Nevertheless, I have, some, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, 
that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. When we first come to know Jesus Christ as our own and personal Savior, something wonderful happens in our hearts, and we are changed by God's matchless grace. I guess some of the things that happen to us at that particular time is that we want to be in God's house. We want to go to church. We want to be with God's people. We desire to read the Bible, although as young believers we don't understand all about the Bible, but we want to read it. We want to serve anywhere we can serve. We want to be used of God in any way He will use us. We want to see others come to know Jesus Christ as their own and personal Savior. Our hunger and our thirst for people to get saved is uppermost in our lives. There's a burning heart of love for our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. It's there, and it's evident there, because we're young Christians. We've come to know Christ, and there's been a thrill about that. It is a blessing to know that we've come to know him in a personal way. He sought us and found us and brought us to himself, and our lives have been changed by his grace. But many times something happens, and I don't know why it happens, but it happens to probably all of us at one time or another, when we can get cold and careless toward the things of the Lord. I read the story of a man who had been faithful to all the services of the church, but after a while he decided that something happened in the church he didn't like, and so he decided that he would not go anymore. He was very faithful at prayer meeting, and the pastor got very concerned that he was not at the prayer meetings anymore. The pastor didn't know what to do. He was a prominent one in the church. The pastor really didn't know what to do with him, but he loved this man, and he didn't want to go and preach at him. So one night after church, after prayer meeting, he decided he'd stop in to see him. So he stopped in, and the man was sitting in his living room, had a fire going in the fireplace. They sat and talked for a little while, and the pastor decided he would do something that he had never done before, but he decided he'd try this anyway, and he went up and took the tongs, and he took a coal from the burning fire and just laid it out on the edge of the fireplace and went and sat down, and they sat there for a little bit, and that smoldering thing that was ablaze when he took it out of the fire began to cool down, and after a while it just turned black. And the man sat there beside the pastor, and he said, Pastor, you don't have to say anything. I know what you're trying to tell me, and it has happened to me. And I have grown very cold towards the Lord. I hope you will forgive me, and God will forgive me. I will be back to church. I will be back to prayer meeting. I think the cry of all of our hearts is that we might be right with God. I think as I speak to you tonight, and I speak to myself, as they begin to prepare this message for this Sunday uh, night service, I wondered if it was the right message. I struggled with it for a little while, and then I began to look at my own heart, and I thought, yeah, probably it'll be for all of us, and I include myself. I am not exempt from this, but I know for the child of God, there is a cry that we might be right with God and we might live for God. Sometimes we sing the little chorus, I love thee, Lord Jesus, with all of my heart. I love thee, Lord Jesus, with all of my heart. And we sing that and we sing it with hearts that really do love Jesus Christ. But sometimes things can happen and we can get into trouble. 
I want you to go back with me to the Psalms. Would you please talk back to Psalm 42? Psalm 42. I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, three different passages from the Psalms, and I want you to think about what he's doing here. Now remember that he's God's child. David knows the Lord. There's no question in our hearts about that. He knows the Lord. And yet in this passage of Scripture, in verse 1 of chapter 42 of the Psalms, it says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? There's a thirst for God. Now go over to chapter 63 of the Psalms, and you read something similar. It's, it's a similar kind of thing. And it says in verse 1, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. Notice the words now. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Now go over to Psalm 84, please. Psalm 84. And in Psalm 84, uh, it says these words. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2, my soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh, cry out for the living God. God wants us some way to have this hunger, this thirst after him. I'm reading a book titled Desiring God by John Piper. And I've, I've been challenged by this book. It's not an easy book to read. I find it sometimes makes me really think. When I think about myself and I think about our church and I think about what we desire in our church and in our individual lives, God wants us to thirst not for crowds in the church. He wants us to thirst not for great programs in the church. He wants us to thirst not for better preaching in the church. He wants us to thirst not for better music in the church. But he wants us to thirst for him. And that's the cry of the believer. I wrote these things down. Listen to it. It is the Christian desperate for reality and spiritual things, crying for God's touch. It is the Christian recognizing the dryness that exists in his own soul, crying for refreshment. It is the Christian knowing there is no hope apart from his God crying for his help. It is the Christian looking and longing for the Lord's moving in his life. It is the Christian thirsting, literally thirsting for God. There's a thirst that he has for God and for his touch in the individual's life. Now, I'm speaking for the most part to you who know Christ as your Savior, and I know that. But I know what I'm like, and I think probably we're all quite the same. We can get a little bit careless at times. When we get away from the Lord, generally it starts innocently. The Bible's left out of our lives. Prayer is no longer enjoyed. Witnessing is a thing of the past. Church attendance is not a vital and meaningful thing. The spiritual concern we once had for loved ones is faded. Renewal is needed. But it seems we couldn't care less. And that's the way it happens to us. How does that all take place? Backsliding is not a blowout, rather, it's a slow leak. 
It's not something that happens bang and there. It happens slowly and in all of our lives we can get to the place where we do things just because it's the formal thing and the right thing to do. Nothing wrong with what we do. But we do it because it's a have to. It's not a real thing that we do because we want to do it for the glory and praise of God. Turn to the book of Jeremiah for just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 2. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Just two or three verses here I want to point out. We seek satisfaction in something else than what God plans for us to see satis seek satisfaction in. And down in verse, verse 5 of chapter 2, we read these words. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters? Look down in verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. We're going to worship somewhere. It may be an empty place, but we'll seek a place where we can find some satisfaction. Look in chapter 2 and verse 36. Verse 36, and we read these words in verse 36. Why do you get about so much to change your way? We want to, we want to see something happen, so we, we go from one organization to another, one thrill to another, one church after another, and there doesn't seem to be anything that satisfies us at all. In chapter 3, verses 9 and, and 11, 9, to, 9 and 10, rather, we read these words. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet, all, yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. In pretense. In pretense. Now, we don't go out and worship an idol. We, we don't do that. We, we don't bow before idols. We don't want to do that. That is not our plan. But we justify ourselves, according to Jeremiah, we justify ourselves in what we do. And as a result, we get into all kinds of difficulty with that. Now I want to ask you a question before we go back to, to Revelation chapter Two. Would you turn back to that, please? Revelation chapter 2. I want to ask you a couple of questions. I want you to think with me tonight, and I'm not browbeating. I don't do that in my preaching. I've never done that, and I don't plan to do it tonight. When I preach a message like this, I preach to myself. I know what I am, and I know that God knows what I am, so I have to face some things. If things are happening in your life that ought not to be happening in your life, God wants to recover you to a place of blessing again, and he wants the recovery. Now listen to this carefully because it's important. He wants the recovery of love. That may sound a little strange, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, don't turn to this. Let me just give you this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says they had a work of faith, a labor of love, a patience of hope. In Revelation, it says, in verse 2, they had works, labor, and patience. They lost the work of faith, the labor of love, patience of hope. How many times this has happened in our lives? Because if you look into this passage of Scripture, they had a lot of things that were good. Look at it here. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience 
and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Stop right there for a moment. Most of us pastors would be very, very happy to go to a church that has this ingredient in it. They worked. They labored. They did all kinds of things. But they lost something. And it was the ingredient that should never be lost in a church. It should never be lost towards our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. It should never be lost towards one another and loving one another. Should never be lost. But they lost it. Look what it says in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have something against you. You have left. It, that's a deliberate choice. They left their first love. They left it. Now let me ask you a question, and I think this is, this is important right here maybe before I go on to the rest of the passage. Do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember that night or the day or wherever you were that you trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Oh, how I remember that day. What a change had taken place in my life. I can't even explain that. I just know that it happened. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And as I've already told you, I had a hunger and a thirst after the Bible. And I just read and read and read and marked and read and marked and marked and read. And it was just a hunger. And I loved that. Has that always been the case? No, I'm here to tell you that there have been times when that uh, has not been there. Sometimes even as a pastor, I have pastored churches where, where there has been blessing, and then there have been churches where I've pastored where even some of those that I had blessings in, sometimes there were things that happened that just, I don't know what they did to me, but they did something to me. And I lost my view of who I was serving that I wasn't serving that group of people out there. I'm serving him. And folks, listen carefully to me tonight. We need to keep our eye on him. You look at somebody else and you'll find some fault in them. You don't have to look at me very long before you find some faults. I don't have to look at you very long before I find some faults. They're going to be there. They're in all of us. Not one of us exempt. Not one of us. But when I look to him, there aren't any faults. He's the perfect, lovely son of God. And some way, we get our attention on what's happening in the church or what's happening in a certain organization or what's happening as far as, far as organization is concerned in the church or what's happening in music or what's happening in preaching or what's happening... Well, you name it. And somewhere along the line, we get our attention off of him and fix it on circumstances. And he says here, you have all the ingredients that are good, but there's one ingredient you have missed and you've lost it and you've left it and you need to get back to it. You've left your first love. Some people say, well, you know, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be like you were when you first were saved. Well, why not? Isn't it just as thrilling now as it was then? Where have we lost that? I got married one day. I fell in love with that little lady over there. She didn't want me at first. But when she saw what a great guy I was, <laughs> and I saw her at Bible school, and I, 
I chased her. I did all kinds of things to get her attention. And after a while, I got her attention, and then she dropped me. And then she chased me. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, I've loved her from the time I saw her. <laughs> she doesn't think that. She thinks, it, you know, the first time I saw her, I fell in love with her. I don't know why. Maybe because she played the piano. I don't know. But I fell in love with her. And that love is just as real today as it was back then. I'm serious when I say that. I love my wife. And we were facing a number of things a few years ago, as many of you know. I was going to have to do some things I'd never done in my life before, and I knew that I could not do that. But you know what came into play? Love. Love. I didn't want anybody, any other woman. I, you're, one, you're great ladies here, but I don't want any of you. You don't want me either. I just want her. She's been the love of my life for over 61 years and will be until... I, hope, I tell her, we should go together. Maybe the rapture will come. We'll go together. And maybe we'll just die together. I don't know. But anyway, we've been together. Now listen carefully to me. When you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and he does a work in your heart that is real, and you know it, God does something. He changes you. From the inside out, he changes you and makes you new. And you love him. You just love him. You, you pray to him. You read his word. You come to church and there's something there. You don't just, we don't, I hope you don't just come to church because you think you have to. You come to church because you want to be fed and you want God to, God to speak to you so that when you leave here, you're on cloud nine. You, you're, there's a sense in which God has moved in your heart and he said something to you special maybe that day. And you love him. All right, let me get to the rest of this because I'm time's going by too quickly. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture th four things. I want you to get these four things. Number one is remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember. What took you away? What was it that caused you to lose your first love? Remember. Uh, I've had to, at, and, and you've had to do this too at times, when, when you've done something you know you shouldn't have done, and you've said something you know you shouldn't have said, until you get that straightened out. Something's wrong in your life. So we need to remember, there from, from where, where you have fallen. <laughs> that, that is just, this crazy thought just went across my mind. As you get older, you forget. You forget, you know. It's, it's, it's easy to forget when you're older. And I'm, of course, young. You know, you know that. But, but it's easy to forget a lot of things. Margie and I, we, well, we won't go into that, I guess. Just, but it's awful easy to forget. Let's remember. We, we remember where we've fallen from. What caused the fall? What caused me to just come to church? And that's all. What caused me to just want to read the Bible once in a while? And that's all. What caused me to get my heart cold Towards God, what is it? Is there something happened somewhere? I've got to remember it. I've got to remember it. The second word is in, in, in it's another R. It's repent and do the first works. Repent means I turn from whatever that was and I go in the other direction. I repent. And that sometimes can be painful, too, to repent, to get things right. We were down in 
New York State having meetings, and God moved in a church that we were in for, for evangelistic services. And the last Sunday night of those meetings, I don't know how many came forward in the morning and in the evening as well. It was just a move from God. And I saw a lady sitting over to my left, and she sat there after the service was dismissed. And I saw her just sort of with her head bowed, and I thought she was crying, but I didn't know. And I went over. She was a young woman, about 35 years of age, I'm guessing, but in that area. And I sat down alongside of her, and I said, can I help you? She said, I don't think anybody can help me. I said, what's the problem? She said, I don't want to tell you. I said, that's okay. You don't want to tell me? Can you tell the Lord about it? She said, I guess I better tell you too. She said, I'm a married woman. She said, I teach Sunday school in this church. I've worked in this church for years. She said, my husband comes to this church too. We have children. And she said, I have fallen into adultery. I said, really? She said, yes. I said, are you willing to turn from it and get it right? Oh, she said, tonight, as you preached, I remembered my wickedness and how wicked I have been towards my Lord and towards my husband and towards my family. I said, are you willing to repent? and turn from it, get it right with God and with your husband and with your family. I trust your husband will forgive you and you can go on from here. She said, oh, I want to. We prayed, she confessed, she got things straightened out, I think with the Lord. Now I, we left there the next day so I really don't know what happened, but she had to remember and repent. She had to turn from that. That's not an easy thing to do when we have fallen away from God. It's not easy for us to turn from it and repent of it and do the thing that is right. So we're to repent. We're to return and do the first works, it says in this passage of Scripture. Return and do the first works, which means I love the Lord. That's what he's saying here. Go back, go back, go back to the place where you love the Lord. Then he says, and I don't like the last part of this at all. Remember, therefore, from when, where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I'll remove your influence. Do you know... As I've already stated, and I'm not being funny here, but I'm an old man now, and I've, I've been in a lot of churches. I've been blessed beyond measure. I'm so grateful. But I've been in churches where it seems the devil is working overtime to destroy us. And he uses innocent things, crazy things. When I, was preparing, when I was preparing my message, I thought of Samson, who had such great power, and he fooled around with that power, I know that, but in Judges chapter 16, verse 20, it says that he came out as at other times, and he didn't know that the Spirit had departed from him. Spirit had gone. David cried in Psalm 51, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You see, God looks for our love. We've talked about some sins, but the sins are, are the, they, they are so taken care of if we just, we just see Jesus Christ. This afternoon when I came home, and I'm a little bit tired, and I laid down in, a, in my recliner and went sound asleep for a little while. 
when I awakened, I began to think about Peter. We all know about Peter. We all know that Peter denied the Lord three times, cursed and swore. Then he went out and wept bitterly. I think he got straightened out there. But then in chapter 21, it says that they went fishing and the Lord Jesus was on the shore and he's fire there and getting some fish ready for breakfast and so on and so forth. And they've, they've I'm not going into all the story here because it takes too much time, but they, the Lord Jesus got everything ready there for them and they've had their breakfast. And, and Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me with agape love, with divine love? Peter said, yes, I, I love you. He's, those words are two different words. Agape love, and I love you as a friend, Peter said. I love you as a friend. Jesus said again, do you love me? Divine love. Peter said, I love you as a friend. And then Jesus says again, Peter, do you love me? And it seems like Peter just understood the whole thing for a moment, and he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, the thing that struck me this afternoon when I was thinking about this is, Jesus didn't say, Peter, you denied me. Didn't say that. He didn't say to Peter, you sinned against me. You told me that you were going to go even to death with me. Peter, he didn't say that. He just said, do you love me? When I began to think about that, Love doesn't criticize. Love endures. Love is kind. Love sacrifices. Love doesn't brag or boast. Love exalts others. Love doesn't put others down. Love for Christ is manifest to others, and they are not fooled by our silly cover-ups. Love doesn't curse with its lips. Where there's love, there's life. Dr. Stephen Olford preached a message from this passage of Scripture, which I heard, and he kept repeating these words, and I never forgot it. Do you love me? Jesus said, do you love me? If you love me, It'll take care of a whole lot of other things. Do you love Jesus? Do I love Jesus? Because it puts us all on the spot. How much do I love him? How much, would I, how much would I give? How much would I lay down my life? How much would I, you know the rest. How much do I love him? He loved me and died for me. Desiring God, seeing him lifts the load that nothing else can lift. Seeing him in the church takes away criticism and heartache and heartbreak if we see him. But we need to see him. You may be here tonight. You say things are okay with me, and I'm glad if you can say that. Praise the Lord. I, I'm, I'm not browbeating. I said that in the beginning, and I mean it. I'm not browbeating you. I've been browbeating myself all week because I looked into my own heart. And friends, I know what I am. And I know what he is. 
and I know he's the loveliest. He's the loveliest in my life. He's the perfect one in my life. He's the exalted one in my life. I want it to be that way. And I think you do too. May we surrender ourselves to him so that he can just manifest himself to us in a special, special way. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, I have preached the message that you gave me to preach tonight. I struggled some, but it's your word. And because it's your word, you're able to speak to us, and you have spoken to me even as I've preached. And I'm so grateful for that. I pray for this congregation. I've been around here 10 years or so now. And we love these folks. And we thank you, Lord, for the way that you minister to us. We're coming to some evangelistic meetings in just a couple of weeks. But Wendell Calder, great preacher. But he can't change us. He's a great preacher. I love him. But he can't bring revival blessing in his briefcase. We must look into our own hearts and be right with you so that you can minister to us and through us for your glory and your praise. And Lord, as we close our service tonight, as the worship team comes to sing a number, I pray you'd speak to our hearts. And Lord, if there are those here tonight who need to get saved, help them to see that Christ loved them and gave himself for them. And they can come. I'll be here at the front. And they can come and give their hearts to Christ. It may be that some Christians need to come and just kneel here at the altar and get things right in their lives. That may be so too. But whatever you do in our hearts is all right. I'm not looking for great demonstration. I'm looking for us to love you and to serve you and to be all that you want us to be. Help us tonight, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen.